So I want to talk for a second about um, land land management in and, and access to the coast in Hawaiian culture. So the Hawaiians first got to Hawaii, um, probably the, the current thought is from the Marquesas and their, their giant ocean-going canoes. Um, sometime between probably 300 and 800 um, AD. Um, these guys were incredible navigators, probably the world's greatest navigators. And at any time, people claimed, uh, they could point to the direction of their home island. They could tell the attitude of the stars um, passing overhead, which would give them latitude, and the rising and setting of stars on the horizon was, was something like a compass for those guys. Um, they're really uh, acute to ocean swells. Uh, uh, seabirds like this tern right here um, that uh, these guys would, could tell they were getting close to land for example and so these guys got here um, several hundred uh, uh, you know uh, oh, well between 300 and 800 AD. There's some amount of controversy as to uh, who was the first uh, European to see the Hawaiian Islands um, you know the, the typical story is that Captain Cook came in 1778 um, and that definitely happened, but there's also a lot of um, thought that things like the Spanish gallon, Galleon might have encountered the islands um, as far back as the 1600s. And old charts and uh, a, a globe, a Dutch globe dated at 1613 AD, um, suggest that uh, this Galleon here, this, the Manila, might have seen it. So. So the Spanish were running silver from Mexican mines um, and, and going past Hawaii, uh, going to Manila and the Philippines for um, a long time. And, and so there's, there's an excellent chance that these guys probably passed by on one of their, um, one of their oceanic forays and actually were the first Europeans to see uh, Hawaii. The modern, um, the most important modern person in, in Hawaiian history would be King Kamehameha, who, well, the guy who would become King Kamehameha. Um, who uh, was the first one to unite the peoples of uh, all the different islands of Hawaii. So Captain Cook arrives in the Cook Islands during um, his, his um, circumnavigation of the globe in 1778 and he's really um, fascinated by the fact that all these Polynesian folks speak more or less the same language and uh, he, first, he first sees Hawaii um, First sees Kauai and Niihau, and uh, then sees the other uh, islands. Um, he, he checks out Hawaii. He names them the Sandwich Islands after his patron, the Earl of Sandwich, who's underwriting his voyages. So for a while, they're known as the Sandwich Islands uh, in, in European cultures. Um, and then he goes on to Alaska, and he uh, uh, cruises up to Alaska, looks for this fabled passage, and uh, does not find it. So it's getting crazy cold and they turn back. So the so Cook gets back to um, Kaliaka, Kaliakuaka Bay um, and uh, after they've come back, to, so they want to provision themselves, they want to get more supplies <clears throat> and, and stock up. And so this is before the reign of, reign of Kamehameha. Kamehameha is about 40 years old or so at this point. Um, it hasn't yet completely um, uh, 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 consolidated power. Um, and so uh, Cook comes out, he meets, meets the then king of Hawaii, and uh, he, he says, you know, come to the island. Uh, Cook goes along um, and uh, provisions uh, themselves in after anchoring the leeward side, and they attract this, the whole time they're attracting more and more and more canoes, um, tons and tons of folks perhaps on the order of a thousand canoes, um, at least 160 of which were double canoes. So these are really large, um, large parties. So the estimate is perhaps maybe as many as 10,000 Hawaiians come out to greet the resolution um, and, and Captain Cook. This is a huge thing. So uh, Cook heads, uh, so they provision, hang out, all that good stuff. And then they take off for Alaska again. As, as they leave, um, they have one of their main masts broken and they have to turn back and come back to Hawaii to repair it. Unfortunately, um, they came during the season of peace, uh, the Makahine Iki, 
And when they came back, by the time they got back, it, it, that was over. And this was a time when, when you weren't supposed to necessarily be peaceful. So people started getting ticked off. And um, some uh, Hawaiians basically came out and stole one of the longboats from Cook's ship, the Resolution. And uh, Cook got angry. So he went on to land and he took uh, King, uh, he, he took the king's, uh, he took the king as, as hostage and said, hey, I'm gonna, I want my boat back and then I'll let you go. And it didn't, didn't go well. Um, so Kamehameha, who was then one of the, the chiefs, but not yet king, um, was actually injured as um, uh, the, this battle raged. So people started getting crazy. Uh, people started getting getting crazy. The the um, uh, cook's vessels fire on shore. King Kamehameha is hurt by um, fragments, essentially from the cannons that hit the rock and explode. And long story short, Cook is killed. Significantly for us in in California, after this whole thing happens, uh, and, and 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 things are quieted down again, the crew goes to uh, uh, the uh, China. And they discover that um, these furs that they had, they, that they obtained in Alaska, are actually incredibly important and, and very, very profitable to be sold in China. So this sets up the uh, eventual fur trade that was run primarily by the Russians that would come down into Alaska and then down into the Pacific Northwest and then into California that would uh, hunt and massively deplete and overharvest our sea otter population. So the king dies and this leads to a, what is in effect of um, a struggle for power between Kamehameha and one of his cousins um, and uh, there's lots of battles and eventually uh, Kamehameha wins Hawaii and then goes on to conquer the rest of uh, the Hawaiian Islands with the last one Kauai falling um, without battle. They, they, just, they, they give up. So as Kamehameha was uh, uh, consolidating his power before he before he got everybody together, all the islands together. Um, he, was, he was sailing into another um, chief's territory around Hilo on the big island, and he saw, saw some folks fishing and uh, got, got up off of his canoe and, and went ashore to fight these guys. And his foot, uh, the legend goes, his foot gets stuck in this lava crack and uh, he gets stuck, and then the fishermen that were just fishing attack him with paddles and crack a paddle over uh, his head. And so later, years later, once he becomes king and he's unifying the islands, um, he, he feels that uh, he was a, a jerk, essentially, and he calls, he finds these fishermen, and he brings them to him, and they think they're, they're gonna get their heads cut off or something like that. And instead, Kamehameha says, um, it's I that should be punished. I, I was, that was a stupid, rash thing, an unfair thing, an unjust thing. And so then he proclaimed the so-called law of the splintered paddle. The law of the splintered paddle uh, says that commoners have the right to travel freely throughout the kingdom and all the islands under the protection without being harmed. So this is this notion, this is one of these first notions of access to the coast movement around and and you can travel unencumbered so by the time so as Kamehameha was coming to power obviously there had been contact with the um, European world and so Kamehameha used some of this technology so this is this image here is representing the so-called battle of the red mouth gun where um, Kamehameha used um, a small ship a schooner the fair American and had a cannon that uh, he helped solidify uh, his power and, and, and other technologies were coming in from the West at this time. Not only were technologies coming in, but so were ideas. And that continues on throughout subsequent generations. So for example, this is a representation of King Kamehameha III. And um, in his, this guy's 1841 constitution for the, the then United Islands of Hawaii that Kamehameha I had, had unified, um, he reaffirms the tradition that the land was held by the chiefs and the people in common. So again, different from the European model. And no man, including the king, could own any part of it. The notion was the land was sacred, the land was immortal, and, uh, and these guys, the notion of ownership was, was, was alien to these guys. So six years later, after that 1841 constitution, 1847, 
um, a lot of these foreign advisors that had come along, business folks, missionaries that came along with the technology. These guys convinced him that land ownership, you know, tr tr European traditions of land ownership and an actual legal title to land would benefit the people. And so uh, he took to distribute the land in what was known as the great uh, Mahe'ili. Uh, and Hawaiians um, didn't really understand what ownership was. Um, and so, you know, some piece of paper, a lot of these guys were illiterate, a lot of these guys didn't really understand this, and they didn't understand, and this allowed um, uh, uh, the birth of the plantation movement. So foreign folks could begin to consolidate smaller tracts of land into bigger. They go to these folks and say, hey, we'll give you a little bit of something, something, and you sign this piece of paper, and then and they took title to land. So that's how they were able to amass these large land holdings. So it's generally viewed as a bad thing. However, um, the thing that uh, Kamehameha III did um, create that still survives is this notion of public access to the shoreline to harvest food. So, so important was fishing and, 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 and gathering resources from the sea that you cannot restrict that. So the traditional approach back in the day was, was land owned by, in, by watersheds. So a village or a chief would control a watershed. Um, we progress into Kamehameha unifying the islands and then we progress into this notion of colonialism and we get this, this, modern, um, this modern European sense of land ownership. And so that turns, in many cases, turns the, the, local, the native Hawaiians into serfs and they are serving mostly foreign powers in these large plantation type complexes. And, uh, and, and we essentially are still living with the land use saga of that today.